Welcome to NSK Web Seminars, where you can find live, interactive learning at your desktop. Today's Web Seminar is part of our NGSS series, and it is titled, Teaching NGSS in the Elementary School, 5th Grade. Our presenters are Ted Willard, Carla Zemble fall Mary Starr, Kathy Renfrew. My name is Sue Hokinen, and I will be moderating today's program. Flavio Mendez is online with us to provide technical support. I want to remind you to visit the NSTA Learning Center, your online portal for professional learning and over 11,900 resources for science educators. You'll find that 4,200 of those resources are free and you can add them to your library to access when it is convenient for you. You can organize your resources by bundling them into collections or access thousands of other collections made by the NSTA and other teachers. I encourage you to join the conversation in the community forums where you can discuss content and classroom issues with other teachers. And I'm actually going to go ahead and post a link for you for that. Right there. And you can, um, I encourage you to also use the other free tools within the NSTA Learning Center to help you organize your own professional development to meet your professional development goals and it's all available at learningcenter.nsta.org. And now I'd like to I would like to introduce today's presenters. Ted Willard is the director of NGSS at NSTA with, with the NSTA. Carla Zemble Fall is a professor of science education at Penn State University. Mary Starr is the executive director of Michigan Mathematics and Science Centers Network. And Kathy Renfrew is the K-5 Science Coordinator for Vermont Edu Agency of Education and an NGSS Curator. Welcome, everyone. And Ted, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Sue. I really appreciate that. I'm um, going to give you guys all just a sort of brief intro, get us all on the same page about the standards, make sure that we are um, have a, a little bit of quick tutorial here, just a few minutes. Um, there are four organizations that were involved in the development of NGSS. You have the National Academies, you have ACHIEVE, you have the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and my personal favorite, I'm a little biased, uh, NSTA. And there's a two-step process in developing the standards. There was first the development of a framework for K-12 science education, and then the standards itself. And those standards are designed to help think through curriculum, instruction, assessments, pre-service education, I know we've got a bunch of pre-service folks here, and professional learning. So thrilled to, thrilled to have you all folks here. So let's look a, take a look at the um, framework, the first piece here. If you haven't read the framework, you need to read the framework. Framework first. Is, I'm actually at a conference today that is uh, uh, all dealing with people interested in NGSS. And one of the speakers brought up again and again that the framework is the first piece to work with in all of this. And so there's no excuse not to use the framework because you can get a free PDF of it from the National Academies Press or you can get your own copy from NSTA Press. And the real piece about the framework is this idea of three-dimensional learning that we're going to be talking about today. There's the science and education practices, sort of the star of NGSS, the cross-cutting concepts, which I sometimes refer to as the uh, Jan Brady of NGSS, and then the disciplinary core ideas, that what we think of as science content. So here are some examples of the practices, things we want our students to do as they're working through pieces, asking questions and defining problems, developing and using models, analyzing and interpreting data, constructing explanations and designing solutions, all these di different pieces here. We then have the cross-cutting concepts, and these are things like patterns, scale, systems, structure and function. Concepts that aren't specifically for biology or chemistry or physics or earth science, but cut across. Get it? Cross-cutting? Cut across all the different science domains. And then we have the disciplinary core ideas, the ideas that are for uh, specific for either physical science, engineering, earth and space science, or life science, and these break down into more detailed pieces, and those detailed pieces break down even to, into more detailed pieces, as you can see here. 
So that's the general structure, and that was all outlined um, by uh, it, within the framework. And so it, and so the standards then go and take that and put it into into meaning. So let's take a look. The standards themselves were developed by a coalition of 26 different states in a process that was um, organized or monitored by Achieve. There's the lead state partners that were involved. And then there was a group of 41 riders stretched across the United States. You can see where they're all from there. And at this point, the NGSS has been adopted in 13 different states and taken the standards wholesale. That's about 3 in 10 students now live in a state where NGSS has been adopted. And that number continues to grow. So here we're taking a look at a particular standard. We've got this idea of constructed argument that plants and animals have internal. Wait, I just want to check one thing here on my side. I've just got one piece that's got a mistake on it. Um, my fault. Conduct an investigation to determine whether the mixing of two or more substances results in new substances. So this idea here, this is a performance expectation. This is what students should know at the end of instruction. It is not, I repeat, not meant to tell a teacher, this is what you have to do in your classroom. We should be thinking about how do I get my students ready to be able to, to do that. But that performance expectation is a great way to probe students' understanding of the three dimensions because this idea of conducting an investigation is part of the practice of planning and carrying out investigations as described here. The piece, um, whether the mixing of two or more substances results in new sub substances relates to the disparate core idea of when two or more different substances are mixed, a new substance with different properties may be formed. And then this aspect of cause and effect. The cause and effect relationships are routinely identified and used to explain change. This is this whole idea of the result in new substances that are described there. And so this performance expectation gives us a chance to really probe at these you know, three different dimensions. And with that little background put in place here, we can now jump into the meat of our presentation. Oh, um, and I'm sorry, we've got some extra slides that are stuck here. Whoops, or one extra slide that's stuck there. Let's go on, on to Carla, Mary, and Kathy. Thanks, Ted. Um, welcome, everyone. We're so glad to see that so many of you are able to participate with us tonight. Um, here in central Pennsylvania, we are in whiteout conditions. We have risked life and limb to, to get to a place where we can talk to you. Um, we hope you're cuddled up with some hot chocolate um, in a warm spot. So we're really pleased to be with you tonight. It is the final um, in our series on teaching NGSS in elementary school with a focus on fifth grade, earth, and human activity. One of the things that um, is really tricky to do um, when, when we're working on these um, webinars is to be able to create a sense of community. And so we really hope that um, you will be able to join us in person at NSTA this year in Chicago. That's coming up soon. Um, we are going to have a spot at the Sherathon, the NGSS at NSTA Sherathon, on Saturday. It starts at 9.30. And I just have to tell you, and my science sisters who I'm co-presenting with tonight, they really, uh, they're, they're making fun of me for being so excited about the ultimate Pi Day, and it turns out that our presentation is on the ultimate Pi Day, 3.1415, and literally at 9.26 in the morning, which is just a couple minutes before we start, it is the, the ultimate. So 3.1415, <laughs> woohoo! So we will have some awesome Pi Day giveaways. Come by and see us at the Sherathon. Um, my name is Carla Zembelsall. I am a professor at Penn State University. I recently co-authored the book, What's Your Evidence? And Engaging K-5 Students and Constructing explanation and, and Explanations in Science. And I'm here tonight with Mary Starr and Kathy Renfrew, uh, also known as my um, partners in crime, science sisters. We're trying to really find something that works. Ted calls us the three musketeers. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mary um, for her introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, the last one, I think you're going to get a little bit more giddiness than we have been uh, previously. Um, my name is Mary Starr. I am the Executive Director of the Michigan Mathematics and Science Centers Network. It is um, 
quite cold here. I'm actually in uh, Chicago um, doing this webinar, and um, as uh, I think it was uh, somebody was saying earlier, uh, it's going to be about negative 35 when chill in the morning, so um, we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm also a co-author of the um, Project-Based Inquiry Science um, series, and I'd love everybody to join me on Twitter, especially for the NGSS chats that happen on alternating Thursdays, and one will be while we are at NSTA on um, March 12th. All right, and now I'll turn it over to Kathy. Hello. Hello, everybody. And, um, as everybody's talked about, this has been an amazing experience working with these two ladies, putting this web seminar series together. Um, I'm Kathy Renfrew. I'm a former elementary school teacher. I haven't been out that long. Um, and I am an NGSS curator, and I just, I'm loving the learning that I'm doing, and I'm loving being able to learn with you. So I look forward to the rest of our presentation with you. Thanks, Kathy and Mary. And the reason that you're hearing so much giggling over here is that I am joined in the room by three people that I'm so happy to call friends and colleagues, and I'll uh, give them a chance to introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Cody, and I teach fifth grade at Park Forest Elementary. I'm Lori McGarry. I also teach fifth grade with Jen at Park Forest Elementary. And I'm Donnie and Stachowie. I'm the principal and lead learner at Park Forest Elementary. And so um, a little bit of background here. I've been working with this crew for a while now. And um, if you have the What's Your Evidence book um, on the DVD video, Jen is part of the, um, she was one of the people who helped us review the initial text uh, for that book and um, is in the teacher focus group that's at the end of the book on the DVD. And Donnie actually wrote the foreword for the book for us. Um, she's been a big supporter of science education for um, quite some time. So glad to have them both, uh, all three of them rather, with us here tonight. And we'll have a chance to, um, to chat with you about the teaching component um, at the point that we get there. Um, but right now what we're going to do is um, I won't sing for you like I did for my faculty <laughs> recently at a, at a uh, retreat about the question, who are you? Uh, but we really want to know who's out there. Um, we got a little sense of this from the polls that Sue ran in the beginning. Um, but we're going to ask you to do a repeat of the where you are with the who you are piece um, in terms of how many of you are fifth grade teachers, how many are science coaches, administrators, university faculty, or other. And then if you can cross that, also think about um, in terms of how long you've been in that, in that role. Sue, do you want to tell, uh, say anything else about a reminder about how to use the tools to do this? Looks like people have it. Sure. It seems like most people do. But just in case you're new and you weren't here for the intro, um, I've given you your whiteboard tools. Go ahead and click on the very bottom box, which is, looks like a mountain with the sun coming over the top of it. Um, uh, another box should open and select a, a particular piece of clip art from that and then stamp it up here. And if you do not have access to the clip, clip art, you can go ahead and type uh, that information into the chat also. But we prefer that you put it up here. I'm, I'm a visual learner myself, so it's nice to be able to see it. And again, the whiteboard tools open on the side. And if they're in the way so that you can't see, you can slide them down if you grab the very top of them. And then just let me know whenever you want me to pause and take away their tools. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, if you're hitting other, it looks like we have a lot of others in the room, and uh, many of them are pre-service um, teachers or teachers at another grade level. If you fall in one of those categories and you just want to make a quick um, note in the chat window, that would be helpful. But it really looks like we have a lot of experienced fifth grade teachers here with us today. I'm really excited about that. Uh, a few administrators, that's always great to see, science coaches. So, um, and a couple university faculty out there um, with a, a, a wide range of experience. We're just really glad to have all of you um, with us here tonight. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and um, get started. Um, we want to remind you um, that it is a very um, strange experience um, being the one who's uh, being the ones who are hosting this. Uh, we're literally looking at a screen, and the only way we get a sense 
minutes of interaction with you is through the polling tools and through the chat window. So um, we really would like to, to hear from you uh, throughout. So please respond to the polls and um, share your ideas in the chat window. And always presume positive intentions. We really do um, want to come together as a community, learn from you, um, and um, support you in your learning. And with that, we're going to turn over to Kathy, and she's going to walk us through the performance expectation that we're going to start with tonight. Right, I am. And I'm just going to briefly talk about what is involved in fifth grade at NGSS. Um, we've been working on all of this um, all, all year, and this is our final um, web seminar. But one of the things I really want us to think about is that a, a large part of what we wanted to do was to really unpack these performance expectations and to show you how those practices can come alive as part of your science instruction. And we want to thank you um, for being participants. Kathy, we can't hear you. You've um, we've lost your mic. Oh, there sorry. you go. Sorry. Um, physical life, um, earth science. Tonight we're really talking about earth systems. Um, and here you can see a picture from some of the work that has been done in the classroom around earth systems. Um, and so that we wanted to share those things with you. And, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Um, each of our performance expectations are made up of um, three pieces. They are a disciplinary core idea, um, a cross-cutting concept in science and engineering practice. And I'm going to start by talking about um, the disciplinary core ideas. Um, the one we're focusing on tonight is the earth and human activities. Um, and that's basically we're looking at um, how the our Earth systems uh, are impacted by humans and our actions. Again, here is our performance expectation. Obtain and combine information about the ways that individuals, communities, everybody use science ideas to protect the Earth's resources and its environment. Um, later in this web seminar, Mary is going to really dig deeper into some of um, these ideas and also provide ideas for dealing with additional PEs. But this is our focus for this night, for tonight. And obtaining and combining information. Um, let's think about what that means as we move on. Again, I'm going to repeat myself just a little bit. A performance expectation is made up of three parts, the disciplinary core ideas, the science and engineering practices, and the cross-cutting concepts. Here on this slide is the disciplinary core idea that human activities really have an impact on our systems. What we do every day really makes a difference in our environment. The science and engineering practice of this particular performance expectation is to obtain and combine information about ways that our communities use science ideas. So where are we going to obtain that information? Well, we're probably going to obtain that information from books, videos, and many different types of sources. But these, this is what brings the science to life. This is what our students are doing. They're the ones that are obtaining and combining information. So we started with that one PE. And before I go too far, I want to reemphasize something that Ted said earlier. That performance expectation is not meant for everyday classroom instruction, that that's what the teacher has to do. That's what we need our students to do after the instruction. So thinking with, with that hat on, 
one of the things that's really important to understand is that although the focus of this performance expectation is obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information, look at all the places this arrow touches, developing explanations, engaging in arguments, developing and using models. Instruction to meet a performance expectation really needs to include many different practices. And again, it's our students doing those practices, engaged in those practices. And the final and far from the least important part of this is the cross-cutting concept. Um, the cross-cutting concept um, for this particular um, piece of, of a, this is, excuse me, I've kind of lost my way here for a second. The, the, the cross-cutting concept for this particular piece is how humans can impact the Earth systems by what we do, as I said before, how everything we do has an impact. And also, what can we then do to help preserve our resources and treat our, our environment kindly? And I'm going to turn it back to Carla. And with that, we're moving into the second part of the, the webinar. So there's been a lot of background information from Ted about how NGSS um, was developed and um, from Kathy in terms of the particular performance expectation that we'll be focusing on here. But now we're shifting over to the actual classroom component and how this uh, plays out in a fifth grade classroom, this particular performance expectation. And as we've done this work um, as a group, we've uh, found it very helpful uh, to use the notion of a coherent science content storyline to frame what it is that we're doing. And that's a little bit different. So if you go online and look at the um, and look at NGSS, there are NGSS storylines. Um, we're those are like small narratives about the content and the. Um, the, the actually all three dimensions and how they come together and the kinds of questions they answer. For us, we're talking about Kathy's, Kathy Roth's work that came out of the, um, uh, the video study, the TIMS video study, and really we're looking at having a main learning goal and framing around a goal statement or a question, and then really making sure that those coherence, that the kinds of activities that you select and the order in which you sequence them, that those make sense in, um, in relationship to that learning goal and that content ideas are linked to one another across. And I know this may seem obvious, but in the Tim's video study, it really revealed that we're in the United States, we're very activity heavy, um, and there's not necessarily connections as clear as we would hope that there would be to the science that the activities are supposed to represent. So we try and keep this in mind um, as, we, as we move through this. So we're taking that performance expectation, and we'd like to look at what the storyline is for that particular performance expectation. And the resource that we used is the Living Together Unit from Project Based Increased Science. Um, Mary Starr is actually one of the authors of, of this unit. Um, and the unit itself is organized into three learning sets. And each learning set has a, um, has a, has a question that organizes the investigations and the content and the practices and cross-cutting concepts of that particular learning set. And then all of the learning sets relate back to the big question. So this actually in practice looks something like this, learning set one. So our big question is how does water quality affect the ecology of a community? Learning set one focuses on how uh, do flowing water and land interact in a community? That's where students look at watersheds, they develop water flow models, land use models, explore sources of pollution, and all of those investigations then help answer that question for the learning set. And once that question is addressed with evidence um, from their investigations, it's related back to the big question about how does water quality affect the ecology. So every time there's a pause between learning sets, it loops back around to that big question. So when you get to learning set number two, it draws on what students learned in learning set one. It moves on to, in learning set two, water quality and how we determine it. 
There are a number of investigations that help answer that question, and then students re return to that driving question. And so here's an example. These are actually from Lori's classroom. Lori's here with us tonight, and this is how she organized her students as they went through the investigations, how they relate to the learning sets, and then ultimately back to the big question. But we're going to do things a little bit differently tonight. The thing that we're focused on is really this notion of evidence of learning in the end. So there's the big question, there are these learning sets. How do you know whether students have met the performance expectation? We get asked this question a lot. How many lessons does it take? How do you know when students get there? And really the intention of the performance expectation is what students should be able to do by the end of instruction, not in any given lesson. So this question of what counts as evidence of learning is where we're going to place our emphasis tonight. And in thinking about that, we'd like to do a small poll with you and get you involved. If this were the um, learning sequence that you were moving through, or if you've taught a sequence like this before, what are the summative assessments that you would use or, or have used um, for these science ideas and practices? And so um, can you walk us through that, um, Sue, in terms of how to use the polling sure. again? Okay, so underneath your name at the very top, you'll see uh, four buttons going across. The very far one on the right-hand side has the letter A on it. If you left click on that, I believe it's a left click, yep, left click on that, um, you should get a drop down menu and from that drop down menu make your selection. So you're going to select A for a test or quiz, B combining multiple formative assessments, C student presentations individually or in groups, and D is for other. And if you're going to select D, um, please post something also in the um, chat so that we have some idea of what those others might include. And whenever you are ready for me to lock the poll, I will, but they are still coming in. And again, and again mind, it's really helpful to have you um, participating with the polling tools or in the chat box if you, can't, um, if you can't access the polling tools from your device. And I noticed a couple people selecting um, more than one. Would you like them to select the one? I mean, they're typing that into the chat. Is, should they select the one that they do most often? Perhaps just to give us that poll and then add the other into the chat? Sure, that would be great. We're going to give it just another minute or so here. And OK. And again, um, underneath your name at the very top, the letter A, I see some of you guys are typing into the chat, and that may be because you do not have access to these tools. But if you do have access, please use them. We've got almost 200 people in the room with us, and we're just at about 100 people responding. I know it's cold, guys. I think you'll get your fingers warmed up, right? If you move your fingers around to press the poll buttons. All right, let's wrap the poll, Sue. Okay, and it's not really that we had 88 people who didn't respond. I see a lot of responses that happened in the chat window. So when I'm trying to look across chat, I see a lot of multiple answers, and I see a lot of Bs and Cs. Quite honestly, across the board, um, people are using all of these different approaches, a lot of student presentations. Um, and so what we would like to do tonight is um, we are actually going to focus on the student presentation component as one way to assess. And there are many different, there, again, you combining the multiple formative assessments is a very popular way. Sometimes you just have to check in and get kids to be able to respond. But we're going to really explore the possibility of student presentations as a way to really get a sense of what they're understanding from a unit of study like this on human impacts to the environment. So here's the idea we had talked about for each learning set. We're connecting back to the big question about how does water quality affect the ecology of a community. But then there's a challenge for students, and that's the summative assessment. And that summative assessment, the interesting thing about that is that children know about it from the very first day when the, this is all introduced or the very beginning of the unit. They know about the big question and they know about the challenge that's coming down the way. The notion that they're going to be giving advice to the town of Lamego, which is a really, it's a real town, um, about what they should be taking into account in deciding whether or not Fabco, um, this industrial plant, should be built there. And so not only after each learning set, like I said, do students go back to the big question, but they also 
are considering in an ongoing way throughout the whole unit of instruction this notion of the summative assessment and the challenge that they're going to have to answer by the end of it. And this is, um, so we may have a, a more of an opportunity to, to talk about this. Actually, I'm going to change things up a minute and ask um, Jen to chime in. This is a strategy that Jen used in her classroom, which was a project board. And this shows how after, um, that students aren't just revisiting the big question, but they also had a space, the groups did, to be able to um, kind of hash out what their changes in thinking were in light of new things that they were learning about over a many weeks um, that were devoted to this unit. So can you have they can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. So I presented to my students the idea of an evidence board similar to what it, I guess a police investigator would use in trying to solve a crime. And um, and the idea that you would have an initial kind of gut reaction about the the problem and I gave them the opportunity to share their thinking before they ran their investigations. And then once they gathered evidence, they came back and either changed their thinking or put up the evidence that they had that kind of backed up their initial thinking. And as we worked through each of the different learning sets, their ideas changed drastically as new evidence was accumulated. And we used this board to kind of keep it all in order. As keep track have. of it, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's a lot for kids to keep track of, but the idea of revisiting it is, is really, really, really important. So, um, and we'll show you a little bit more about, they, they, Jen and Laura use multiple strategies in their classroom to help kids um, continue to connect back to the big ideas and so, and the challenge. So we'll, we'll um, share a little bit about that later. So thanks, Jen. Um, so, what we'd like to do now is share with you um, an actual video of the kids' presentations. And, and, and this is, a, again, really different than the kind of video that we've shown in prior um, webinars because the focus is on the, is actually the kids. You won't see any teachers in this. But we hope that you're thinking in the back of your mind what teachers had to do to get help get the kids here, right? Um, so. Um, I just need to remind people that we are in central rural Pennsylvania. Um, that is a fact of life for us. We are geographically isolated, even though we have um, multiple urban centers within two, or three, four hours reach of us. Um, we are working with experienced teachers, so Jen and Lori are, we're actually part of leading, and this is a whole other story that's going on in here if people want to know about it later, that Jen and Lori and I were working together to lead a study group on their, in the fifth grade environmental science unit. So other teachers were coming, we were considering possible revisions, we were looking at this project-based inquiry science as one possible resource, and we were trying it out together. So there were multiple opportunities for teachers to kind of come back together and talk about what was working, what wasn't working, and how to support student learning. So again, um, really experienced teachers um, that are with us tonight. Um, the video was edited down, so there were like two over an hour sessions in, in both classes where groups were presenting, and what I did for tonight was just kind of look across those and try and tell the story of a presentation front to end in about six minutes, which is an impossible task, um, but to be able to give you a feel for, for what the kids were actually able to do on their own um, in response to that challenge of giving Wamega some advice. Um, and I always add this line about courage in the name of professional learning. It, it, it takes a, a crazy kind of, of, of bravery to get up in front of colleagues that you know and colleagues that you don't know and open up your classroom um, and allow people to come in and video record you and your students and then show it to the world. Um, and so I, I am the first to say that I think these teachers are superheroes and so are the kids in their class. We ask as you provide comments in the chat board that you really think about that and, and what it takes to um, be able to pull that off and be confident enough that you have something to learn from what you'll hear from your colleagues by doing that. But if we didn't have people who opened up their classrooms to us, we would never learn. Um, so I think the practice connection is really important. So please keep that in mind and, and join me um, in thanking the group here for um, being willing to do that with us tonight. 
I'm going to introduce the reflection question for the video before we actually see the video so you can be thinking about this. Um, after the video, we'll just kind of come back together and talk about it in the chat window, and then we can ask some questions of Lori and um, Jen. But did, we want you to be thinking about, did the students meet the performance expectations, and how do you know? Not just did they, but how do you know? from the presentations of the kids. And, and I added the performance expectation again back at the bottom of this slide. Um, is there evidence of learning beyond the performance expectation? So um, is there anything else in there that you think is um, important to identify? And how did the teachers likely support um, student learning so that they would be able to do this. And so those are the things that um, we'd like you to be thinking about. And with that, I'm going to ask Sue to help guide us through launching um, the video. And we hope that this works for you. If it does not, um, there will be a link. It's only six minutes, so hang in there with us. Um, and there will be a link that you can go and view this um, on your own time um, outside of the webinar. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put the link first in the chat window, just in case it does not push out um, to you, then you can try clicking on it in the chat. But please, please be patient. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open this up in a separate browser, so it'll actually push out to you, and it'll open up in a separate browser, and then you'll need to come back to us when it's over. And I'm going to put the green check marks up. Um, where the polling tool usually is, so when you get back, you can give us a green check to let us know you're back. So here we go. Oh, it's telling me it's an invalid web address. Let me try it one more time. And I'm still getting an invalid URL. Let me pull up the actual PowerPoint in the meantime. Um, if anybody in the moderator chat has it and can send it to me, the link is working. OK, so for some reason, it's not opening it up there. OK, let me see what I can find here real quick. And I'll try to get it pushed out to you. There we go. And with that, I'll quiet my mic. You'll need to click on the video to make it start. And it may show up behind your screen, behind the Blackboard Collaborate screen. So just find your browser.
It looks like um, people are starting to uh, wind down on the video, so what I'm going to do is um, move to the next slide just so those people who are back and as you come back into the room, if you can um, chat some uh, reflections that are guided by what you see on the screen about meeting the performance expectations, evidence of learning beyond the performance expectation, and what teachers likely did to support student learning. And we'll be back in a second to talk about some of these. So there are lots of great comments coming in here in relation to the um, performance expectation. Um, so everything from how the students participated, how they drew on their um, examples and investigations to be able to support the recommendations that they were making. Um, clearly, they had multiple sources of information, and that's a piece about the performance expectation in terms of combining information um, about these science ideas to protect Earth's resources and environment. Um, and again, you know, we had like really good presentations that were at least this long by each group, so you're only getting a snapshot here. Um, looking at qualitative and quantitative analysis of macros, so again, multiple sources, some of that involved hands-on first-hand investigation, some of that involved modeling, um, like the watershed model with the Unifix cubes. Um, so a number of different things that students were able to do. What about this notion, before I actually ask the teachers in the room, how do you think teachers go about supporting kids and being able to um, do this kind of work and demonstrate this kind of learning? Kristen, thanks for your comment. We'll let the students know how impressive yeah. you thought they were. Yeah. They, will, they will love that. So as, as people chime in here, um, Lori and uh, Jen, how did you go about um, getting students um, ready to do this? Clearly, giving this kind of presentation isn't something that a fifth grader does every day. So um, how do you go from however many weeks you did on this, uh, like a couple months, about six to, eight weeks, six to eight weeks of instruction to kids being able to synthesize this information in a way um, that was demonstrated here? Just really fast, I wanted to say the six to eight week thing, I try not to be scared about that. We even we integrated a lot of language arts into our science time. So we covered many bases while we were working on this unit. And I just felt like that was important to say before. Oh, good. And that was Jen, this is Lori now. <laughs> I think there were a couple key key components to getting them ready throughout the course of the unit. One, as a lot of the comments have mentioned, is the importance of keeping those questions in front of students throughout the entire process, not only the big questions, but the learning set questions. They need to know throughout what questions are they trying to answer. Their investigations have purpose. And then when they're doing the investigations, that they are heavily involved in designing, constructing, running, uh, and you know, observing their own models so that they're gathering evidence all along the way that is designed to answer the questions. By the time they get to the end of the unit, they not only have a real stake in answering the question and helping Wilmingo make uh, a good decision, uh, but they also have a clear understanding of what they've learned. So one way we went about that was giving them their summative assessment assignment and encouraging them to go back through their science journals to reflect on all the investigations we did along the way and then to chunk their own learning in a way that they could present to the community uh, their learning and their recommendations. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So to that question of like how long does it take to do the lesson, this is multiple lessons over multiple weeks that's framed around a coherent content storyline. And I saw some questions about storyline before. Um, we're talking about uh, the kind of storyline that really um, takes those 
those questions and those big ideas, groups them, sequences them, and provides opportunities to investigate and then loop back to those over time. So uh, really kind of a, 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 a thorough, well thought out way of doing this. It's not by accident. Again, um, Mary um, and the group that she worked with spent a lot of time working with teachers in the development of these kinds of resources, and it's just incredibly powerful when those come to play in terms of what students can actually do. Um, so what, what were you answering? How much time per day was devoted to science? 40 minutes to an hour, but the important part of that was, uh, like Jen said, they were integrating um, across the curriculum to be able to do that. We also flip-flop our science and social studies units, so we weren't teaching them concurrently. We did all science for one unit and then all social studies. Okay, so thanks. We're going to... Um, peek on to this next part, um, one of the things I wanted to come back to, and I don't know how these got all out of order, the point is there is no order, um, so we only put numbers there so we can get you to look at number eight or get you to look at number three and we know what we're talking about, so, um, but in this particular um, this particular example, we were focused on a performance expectation that integrated the obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information, but in focusing on that particular practice, we also were able to attend to other practices, and in particular, this um, using evidence and developing explanations. So what you'll notice um, in when you kind of look through the kinds of artifacts that kids developed is that they did investigations and to make sense of their observations and to make sense of how their model worked, um, they used claims and evidence. Um, and reasoning to do that, and they did that in multiple different ways. This is just an example of um, how whiteboards um, were used to do that, and then groups got to compare across their different ideas here. Um, but the framework that we're actually using to inform this is the claims evidence reasoning rebuttal framework that was developed by Kate McNeil and Joe Krejcik, two very great colleagues. Um, Kate co-authored the um, What's Your Evidence book with us. Um, the CER framework actually, um, and I, I'm going to go to the next slide because it demonstrates, I think, a little bit better and more visually that you have kids engage with phenomena. They're asking real interesting questions about phenomena that require investigation. Through investigation, they're collecting evidence which they then use to construct claims that go back and answer those questions. So the teachers were not only trying to um, use this resource in their classroom with their kids, but they were also using the CER framework um, to support instruction, basically. And the other thing um, that we'd like to do that depends on uh, the CER framework is a strategy, an instructional strategy that we call the clues chart. Lori was just saying how important it is to keep those questions in front of kids. And again, if you're doing six weeks of instruction, how do you create an artifact that allows them to kind of track and monitor their learning um, and the kinds of claims and evidence that they're um, working with over time. And so the clues chart is something that we use to do this. The the K in the clues chart is um, the beginning ideas. We ask kids for their predictions or their initial thoughts about things. Um, the claims are the what the L column, what are we learning, and we make that active. So it's not what we learned in the past, but what we're learning. What's our evidence um, is the E, and we usually directly connect that up with the kinds of claims uh, that we're, we're, we're making. Um, w stands for wondering about the phenomena, so a lot of times when you're doing this kind of work, naturally new questions come up, new researchable questions, and we want to be able to be responsive to those. And finally, the different science ideas, science terminology, science principles um, that we use to strengthen um, the argument um, with reasoning. And so this is what, um, this is Jen's classroom. This is an example of the clues chart that she developed with the fifth grade students. Jen and Lori are actually across the hall from each other. So it's interesting to see each of them have a different, a slightly different take on how to do this. Um, Jen was using um, this to add the different parts so uh, uh, the kids would talk about it and then she would type it out and get it in there. So um, it was the what they finally negotiated went on the board rather than it was a working board like the other project board that you saw. Here's the clues chart um, that Lori um, used in 
in her room um, with a big question up top, and then the students were um, working on their learning and evidence um, throughout that. So this is a really nice um, strategy to be able to use. Clues charts are highlighted in the February issue this month of Science and Children, so um, if you want to go check that out, you can find out more information about clues charts. And if you come visit us at the share um, at NSTA, we'll have multiple examples of clues charts and science content storylines that we can share with you. But at this point, we're going to come up for air and see what you would like to know about how our teacher colleagues here thought about the summative assessment um, or even the unit and how they planned for it. While you're writing some of your questions in the chat box, I'm going to start by asking them um, if I can find it. <laughs> um, what was different about teaching it this way? Because they were teaching an environmental science unit already. Mm -hmm. Many of the activities were the same. Um, they, they, you know, you said they were familiar to you when you first saw that. Um, but by the time you got to the end, you said the learning experience for students was very different. And so I'd like you to respond to that because um, Sometimes I, when I'm talking to teachers, I hear this notion of, well, the activities are the same, so I'm already doing NGSS in my classroom. And you are kind of saying, well, the activities were the same, but doing science this way was very different. So um, the mic's open, so go ahead and um, let's start by responding. Um, so one. before this unit, I taught the, um, the PBIS unit that we used, I taught our normal fifth grade science unit of environmental science for seven, eight years. And I, although I've tried to make it better as the years went on, I was always missing the storyline. So the, the lessons always seemed compartmentalized. It was really hard to make connections between them in a way that um, was relevant to the kids. And so once we were presented with this this PBIS book with the storyline in it, we were able to say, oh, not only did we have all of, a number of these lessons already, we had a lot of extraneous stuff in our binder that just made no sense, and I guess it addressed some standards, but it was irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. So we threw out a bunch of stuff, we pulled in the PBIS book, started using the storyline, and started to see things making sense and light bulbs going on really fast for the kids. Mm -hmm. One thing I think I struggled with prior to using this resource and the storyline in the wet in the same way is um, the idea of model building. Um, there's a lot that we did that was hands-on learning, but the idea of building a model with the intent of modeling a real-world situation and being able to answer questions about it and understand it from the model um, was very new with this resource, and I think that can be very intimidating um, going into it, but starting with very simple models, like the ones you saw about water flow and elevation, and then building more complexity into models over time once uh, the students become more familiar with the idea of model building um, was a very different approach than what we had done with just activities in the past. So I'm, I'm watching some of the um, some of the comments and questions. Um, there were uh, several questions about grouping, how you grouped your students. I mean, one oh. thing you didn't see here that I had to cut out um, just because I was trying to get a flow was that there were students with um, special needs that were also included in these presentations and supported by their classmates. So can you say more about yeah. grouping overall in that? I just want to say that some of the comments that you made about how well the students did, we appreciate that very much. They worked really hard. and. Um, something else that's important to note is we're both self-contained fifth grade classrooms with um, a great spectrum of learning needs, ability. We have ESL students. We have the whole gamut in our classes. And so um, we made very thoughtful groups. And um, we had groups of about six students in each group. Um, we had about four groups. We had four groups each, right? Mm -hmm. and I don't, they, they just played off of each other. The, the strengths, some were, you know, wonderful science thinkers to begin with, some were excellent communicators. 
Yeah. It was really neat to watch the whole thing. This is Carla because, um, you know, when if a student got lost or stuck, another teammate would help them out. I mean, it was really collaborative and supportive. You could really tell that they were all working together to make this happen. I, I've been watching Don oh, Ann sure. um, yeah. shake her head. She was there at the presentations, um, the group presentations, supporting the students and the teachers. I'm noticing a question about integration. Um, this is another area we've struggled with in the past with um, finding appropriate nonfiction passages uh, for students to read that were relevant to the content and actually drove their learning forward. Um, and this resource really helped us with that because the readings were largely appropriate for our students. This was not an exceptional bunch of students um, as far as fifth graders go. Um, but because of the way that the readings were integrated with the investigations, they had things to anchor to, and the groupings helped. We had reading partners, peer supports in the classroom, um, so we had the right reading at the right time, and we were able to use excerpts of it as needed to move them forward rather than just lecturing them on material. Uh, they were actually able to read it for themselves. I saw um, up above, you know, what do you do if you're not a self-contained classroom, you've got 25 kids and need space, and, and I mean, that's the, you really want kids to engage with the phenomena and be able to build models, so um, beg, borrow, and steal, do whatever you need to do to get that kind of space. Um, even, even in self-contained classrooms, Jen and Lori are shaking their heads, they had to do that as well. Um, the other thing is, if you're trying to use a clues chart, because it's so important to be able to monitor this over time, um, we've seen people do that in lots of different ways. We've seen it like the paper way where you, you know, have a big poster and you roll it up when you don't have that group of students and you bring it back out for that group of students when you do have them. If you have limited space, we've seen people do it electronically and project it and continue to work on it with kids so that it's that constant um, link back to uh, what kids are learning over time. Um, the one question that also came up over and over again, ladies, is uh, about the actual evaluation. Like, how do you, how do you actually turn like this wonderful uh, assessment opportunity into a grade that gets entered in your grade book? And how do you do that? We were very clear with the students. We uh, we gave them an assignment. We gave them a rubric that we would be evaluating them with during the presentations. And before they ever presented, we would go back through the presentations with them to practice, making sure they've addressed everything in the rubric, making sure they've addressed it at a high level of quality, that they had evidence to back up all their claims. Uh, and so they knew very clearly um, on what basis we would be evaluating them. But it was still a very supportive um, process. As many of you commented, presenting at this level for fifth graders is still an intimidating event, even within their classroom. So we really wanted this to be uh, a place where students were giving each other put-ups as they were going. And yes, they were all receiving a group grade together, but the focus was less on the grade and more on them accomplishing uh, this great work at the fifth grade level. Yeah. Can I put in one thing? Really quickly, I know this really fast. Um, one thing, we spent a lot of time with science books this year, and the kids wrote volumes mm -hmm. without, we didn't really have an expectation per se that they would produce this much, but their writing improved vastly from the beginning of the school year through this curriculum. Yeah. And because we have Donnie here, I'd really like to talk about the importance of, um, if you could, Donnie, the the ability to support teachers in trying new things like this and support for the actual approaches that they were trying to take in their classroom with their kids. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Carla for the opportunity to do this and for Lori and Jen for stepping up and their other two colleagues who were willing to do this along with them. And they, Lori and Jen were great leaders, both as, as part of a district-wide study group and also with their team and encouraging them. So two phenomenal teachers in case you haven't figured that out. And, um, you know, some of you were asking about the classrooms, we have fully included classrooms, so ESL, autistic support, or students with autism, you know, um, students with learning disabilities, the whole range in, all, in everybody's classrooms, and, and the ultimate goal is success. So using across the curriculum and using it to address reading and writing and science and um, even a little social studies in there and geography and so um, they did a phenomenal job. The presentations were awesome. I went up and sat through all of them, tweeted a little bit from them, and um, just was really impressed with the, 
what the students were able to do. I mean, the difference, you, Carla asked this earlier about the difference. I mean, what I saw the difference was there was a purpose in what they were doing. They weren't just doing a series of activities. There was some reason that they were putting all this information together. And, you know, the claims, evidence, and reasoning really, um, really put that together. I noticed today, Lori and I are co-teaching something right now, and Today, as we were both, as all of us were working with our different groups, I noticed how much how much closer the students are looking and taking notes at everything they're doing, which I didn't see last year when Lori and I did the similar co-teaching. So, uh, pretty phenomenal what I'm seeing happening with kids and how they're engaged and enthused and you know just really. Learning. Yeah. It's awesome. It's so, it's so exciting. And it wouldn't be possible without your support. I think it's so important um, because if a, a principal goes into a classroom <laughs> and something like this is going on, they might not immediately recognize that it's integrated learning, that it's meeting the needs of all students. I mean, you really have to have the principal or the administration in, in support of trying these new kinds of things. And did you hear that, Donnie? And his principal's co-teaching with her teachers. I, I mean, who does that? That's so awesome. But I'm worried about time, so I'm going to um, hand it over to Mary. One of the questions that came up, Mary, was around um, bundling and, and an opportunity to bundle um, content around this performance expectation. And I am so glad that your mind was on that, too. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. I have been watching the chat window with great enthusiasm. And um, actually, I also was um, moved by the students' um, uh, presentations that they did. What we thought we would do is um, look at this uh, bundling idea. So um, what we what we've been doing in all of the webinars is picking one performance expectation and really focusing on that one performance expectation. And part of that is because of this hour in a you know 15 minute format and the fact that just getting six minutes of video um, to watch is, is really difficult. So if we had performance ex more than one performance expectation, we would get much more complicated conversations. Um, so we're going to focus uh, just for a second on this disciplinary core idea the, um, that came out of the, the PE that we've been talking about, um, ESS 3.1 for the fifth grade. And it says here that um, students are going to think about human activities and the effects on land, vegetation, streams, ocean, air, and even outer space. And I really wanted to point out that in this unit, the um, teachers um, didn't try to uh, slam in the learning about all of those things, right? So we really are focusing in this unit, and I, I want to encourage people to really think through what they're doing, um, that every single piece of every disciplinary core idea doesn't have to end up in every uh, learning sequence. So in this case, the focus was on uh, vegetation and streams, and they did not move to ocean, air, and even outer space in this um, idea that we have to really um, focus on every single piece of a disciplinary core idea um, in each learning sequence. Um, I wanted to point out that we've changed the format of what, uh, how we're providing you this information. So these tables for today are from the NGSS um, quick, NSTA quick reference guide to the NGSS for elementary school. And Ted Willard is the editor of this um, volume. And I have actually found it to be really, really useful in thinking about these elementary um, uh, webinars. So I would encourage you to look at that, uh, that reference. Um, not as a total replacement for um, the NGSS site or certainly not as uh, a replacement for the framework, but as another resource that helps you to understand um, the way NGSS will work in elementary school. So the question then was about bundling and whether the students would only be really focused on that one performance expectation of 5 ESS 3.1 in that whole unit. And in fact, um, Really, there's a lot of opportunities in this this experience that the kids were having with um, 
with uh, the fifth graders in um, State College with the multiple uh, performance expectations. And, and I've included some of them on, this, on the uh, slide because we really are looking at these opportunities for powerful units that create um, motivating experiences for kids and then really look at each one of these um, at opportunities to connect many uh, uh, performance expectations into one unit. Again, remembering that not every single bit of each of the PEs has to be in every single unit. So um, we might not ever finish a unit if we think that we also have to worry about oceans and outer space in a uh, unit about ecosystems. Um, so what I would encourage is that when, we're, when you're thinking about uh, designing materials and pulling together those um, storylines, to really focus on that coherent storyline, not storylines with, I don't know, we would, I would call them bird walks, right? So not a bunch of bird walks, but a, a nice coherent storyline that continues the kids' motivation towards that end project. Um, if, if you flip back to those um, performance expectations that we might bundle, you'd notice that there's actually two um, practices that are within those PEs. Uh, the one that we started this with was obtaining communicating information for this webinar. And then there were two or three others and the practice is developing and using models. So in the video you could see that both of these uh, science and engineering practices are really well used for the storyline um, by these fifth graders. Um, and then you would maybe use others, uh, have the students engage in others that would support the learning, but maybe foreground two or three of the practices within a unit. Um, again, not attempting to um, use uh, necessarily all eight science and engineering practices in any one unit. Uh, the focus for the PE we've been using is systems and system models. Um, it's also, uh, although we would love to include Jan Brady in everything, as Ted likes to call the cross-cutting concepts, um, limiting the number of cross-cutting concepts and then being explicit with them when students are using them and helping students to really understand that that's what they're doing at any one point is also um, very critical. So I, I guess my bundling idea is that it's important to use multiple performance expectations within a, a unit, but not all of them are at the foreground. And certainly, we don't have to use every single piece of each performance expectation. The PEs are end uh, results, they're the goals of teaching. And um, we can create units that have um, the bundling idea without uh, thinking about every single a component of each one of those um, PEs. So we've got this. This is all the stuff and there's probably a dozen other bullets that we should be thinking about in um, instruction and in, in getting towards NGSS in our classrooms and it is a lot. Um, and so what's the, the actual final statement about all of this is we're going to have to take some time to do it. We're going to have to really be thoughtful and intentional and think about um, what's right for kids and how are we going to get there in a way that um, maintains the meaning of NGSS and goes back to what Ted said at the very beginning of the webinar, which is um, framework first, where the vision of NGSS actually gets played out. So we've um, included a ton of uh, resources and Kathy is actually going to walk you through um, where you'll be able to find some of those resources in the NSTA Learning Center and in other places. Hi, and before I get to those resources, I just wanted us to take another look from and think about our purpose and in doing these web seminars. Um, and it was to really show the importance of engaging students in meaningful science and scientific discourse and practices. That our elementary students um, need a good, strong foundation in order for science to continue growing within themselves as they move on through the grades. We are hoping that these webinars give everybody a chance to really look at 
and really deeply understand NGSS in the early grades. And then you can focus on particular content and practice. And I think Mayor, I heard Mary saying that loud and clear. You know, focus on one piece, include others, but know where you're going with it. Have a purpose. The other big thing that came up a lot in the chat was the literacy piece. And in this in these conversations, these students are obviously engaging in literacy practices. All the time they were doing the science, they were talking to each other, they were writing in their science notebooks, not to mention the presentations, what, what we saw. I mean, it was amazing. Another purpose that we really wanted um, these web seminars to fulfill was to develop a community of practice that really focused on the elementary grades um, and to be a vehicle um, to access instructional resources. So I'm going to tell you about some of the resources that I put in this. Oh, I'm sorry. We have one more thing before we go on. And it's to say, what is one idea of practice that you might take from this webinar that you'll take back to your instructional setting, your venue, whatever that may be? Why don't you share in the chat? In a lot of great responses here, clues, storylines, CER. Very good. CER. I'm so excited clues. to see all these things. I mean, this is what we really wanted to come from this work that we've done over this this year and that we hope will continue in some form or other. We can't speak to it for sure. But I've certainly seen um, loads of, of possibilities from what's coming up in the chat. So with that, after I see the, the chatting, the typing slowing down, I'll move on. But I wanted to give you just a little bit longer um, to get those ideas out. Because we all learn from each other's ideas. I know I've seen some that I want to think about um, in my own work. And I bet Mary has, and I bet Carla has too. OK, I really am going to close out and go on to the next piece. Um, so you can continue writing in the chat your ideas, but I'm going to move to the next slide. So one of the things we have done and we've talked about is the resources that are available to you from um, NSTA. And the NSTA Learning Center is one of those resources. And it has so many resources. Sue talked about them in the beginning of the web seminar. Um, but it's one of the places that I use um, whenever I'm looking for information to work on creating um, some materials. Whenever teachers come to me, the first place I send them in terms of looking for resources is to the NSTA Learning Center. And I hope you'll all spend some time exploring there. So this slide um, brings up just some of the um, pieces that I put in the collection. This is by far not all that's in the collection. Um, but these are some of the resources that we've talked about um, specifically for tonight. And there are also resources that we've talked about throughout the series um, that really crossed every single webinar. I want to highlight again, what's your evidence that Car from Carla? Ready, set, science. Um, and Science and Children, those journals have amazing information. And if you're really looking into some things about um, talk and talk moves, one of the good places to go is to the Inquiry Project and to get yourself a copy of the Talk Science Primer. Um, and it is in the collection. But I just wanted all of 
all of these resources to be available and for people to understand that they're there in one place. Um, and that's what I tried to do um, as I created this. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ted. Thanks very much, Kathy. Just want to sort of first and stop, just take one moment and really thank, you know, Kathy, Mary, and Carla, and the various folks they've collaborated with, the teachers that have opened up. This is the sixth of these elementary se web seminars that we've done this year. They have been the ones leaving them all. It's been it's been just a true pleasure to work with them. They would ne never have worked without their you know tremendous effort on this part and the expertise they have throughout their various careers in in education and different perspectives. I also want to thank all of you folks for for attending this one and for people who attended the others. The NGSS will succeed or fail based upon all the work that you do. You are the real key to this, serving on the front lines, working with students. And you know, we want to try to help you as much as we can. So thank you. Thanks for all of that. Just pointing out that while this is the end of this set of web seminars, it's never over at NSTA. Let's keep that in mind. We have a discussion forum in the NGSS Learning Center. Really encourage you to go to that. I know that Kathy, Carla, and Mary would love to continue these conversations. We also have a, a for edit, those of you who are NST members, there's a listserv devoted specifically to NGSS. Um, we've gone through our whole slew here. I do think that I can picture that at some point in the future you will be seeing um, some of these folks back to talk on some more things here. I think the idea of clues is coming up as a, as a useful topic at some point in the future. Um, there's a ton of archives, the ones we've done this year. You've got the archives for that. Lots of you said this was your first one. Please come and try these others out. We've got lots of great articles in our journals to, to work with around NGSS. Please you know, check those out as well. Um, we mentioned a number of different books here, the framework and the standards. NSTA has reader's guides to both of those. We have some other books along the lines here. And as Wayne's mentioned, we've got a a quick reference guide to NGSS for the elementary level or for other levels as well, or a full K-12 level. There is an app of NGSS. You can find some NSTA resources on that as well to, to make use of and to go through. Um, conference, Chicago, big deal. You know, the three biggest stars of all of NGSS, obviously, Kathy Renfrew, uh, Mary Starr and Carla Zimbalsall will be in Chicago. See them in person. They are more than just a disembodied voice. Um, there's a lot of other things going on with NGSS in Chicago that I greatly encourage you to check out. I'm putting a link in the list here of, of a bunch of NGSS related pieces there to attend. Um, our STEM forum in Minneapolis also coming up. And down the line, you can see if we're coming to a theater near you um, for our fall conferences in 2015. And so with that, I will turn things over to Sue so she can get you set up for your survey. And then beyond that, um, we'll, take a, we'll take a few more questions back here. Sue, to you. Thank you, Ted. And with that, let's give a round of applause. And again, we find that underneath our smiley face. So let's give a round of applause for our, to our presenters this evening, Ted Willard, Carla, Mary, and Kathy. You guys did an absolute amazing job. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So sad to see these come to an end, which means we're going to have to visit you guys in the archives. And I'd also like to thank the Carnegie Corporation of New York for sponsoring today's program. Thank you to the administration of NSTA for their support of web seminars. You can find resources related to today's presentation by going to the web seminar collection in the NSTA Learning Center, which will include the archive to the web seminar and the presentation slides. The collection may also include journal articles and lesson plans, interactive content modules called science objects and side packs, and links to helpful websites and multimedia. I'm going to put a link directly in to the chat window. Give me just a second. Okay, and it's going in now. 
Okay, so there's a link for the actual collection. And also everyone who's registered for this program, I want to remind you that you will receive an email within the next day or so with a link to access this art to the archive and to the collection. And here's a look at what's coming up on web seminar on the web seminar calendar. On February 24th, using the Learning Center as your e-textbook with pre-service teachers. On March 18th, the NSJ Learning Center, free professional learning resources for educators. And on April 15th, STEM starts early, guidance and support from the NSJ Early Childhood Science Education Position Statement. You can register for upcoming programs by visiting learningcenter.nsga.org forward slash web seminars. And let me go ahead and put that link in for you also. Okay, so thank you everyone again for your participation. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again in another NSJ web seminar soon.